Hi, Don Forsyth. Welcome to the analysis of groups and group performance. We have been diligent in our analysis of groups up to this point. We've looked at the factors that determine when a group will form. We've examined group cohesiveness. We've looked at develop the development of groups over time. We've looked at group structure um, as well power within groups and when a leadership will emerge in a group a leader will emerge in a group and, and be effective but now we turn to perhaps the more practical question of group performance for groups are performance engines uh, much of the world's work is performed by groups and people working collectively uh, sometimes even in teams uh, to achieve some some type of goal some collaborative outcome We'll examine groups working initially on very simple tasks, perhaps two individuals working side by sides on a task that doesn't actually require any sort of collaboration. But then we'll move gradually towards more complex types of group tasks, ones which, in which the group members are interdependent and the quality of the group's performance depends fundamentally on how well the group members can combine their individual contributions into a collective contribution. The uh, case study for this particular analysis is a fascinating group. Uh, the group, including the leader, Captain Sullenberger, and his crew uh, that succeeded in landing a jetliner, a uh, disabled jetliner, in the Hudson River successfully with no loss of life. And in this particularly startling in picture, you can see that the, uh, the passengers have been evacuated from the body of the plane and are awaiting rescue by a, another set of groups, um, ferries and boat captains and boat crews um, in the New York City area who came and plucked them from the icy waters of the Hudson without a loss of life whatsoever. But we will explore this particular group as well to try to understand how they were able to perform their tasks so effectively. We'll begin with several questions about groups and the sorts of tasks they perform before turning to the basic question of social facilitation. When will individuals work more effectively in the presence of others? Before in subsequent presentations, we'll turn to questions of social loafing and individual versus group performance. To put it into perspective, groups perform millions of different tasks, um, many different kinds of tasks um, that are often quite varied in the demands they put on group members. But Dr. McGrath and his analysis of group tasks distinguishes between those that require generating a product or a solution, choosing between offered solutions, negotiating either within the group or with other groups, and more physical performance um, execution types of tasks. This, these arrangements of tasks differ along two dimensions, conceptual behavioral um, versus cooperation and conflict. And he summarizes this in his eightfold chart where he begins first with the type one planes, which type tasks are planning out problems um, before moving to performance types, execution tasks such as a dance troupe, for example, performing on stage, or one group contesting against another group, um, such as football teams, for example, or combat units. In this quadrant, we encounter the tasks that require negotiation uh, between either within the group or between groups. Um, in some cases, those negotiations are caused by a conflict of interest so that if one group or one group member succeeds, another group member perhaps will fail or another group will fail. Sometimes, however, it's a conflict among alternatives, conflicting viewpoints regarding ethics or values. There are also more purely decision-making tasks and intellectual tasks where a group must solve a problem or make a choice um, between options, knowing that one choice will be the better task, uh, resulting in success, and another task might be a bad choice, basically resulting in the group's failure, and finally generating ideas. Um, so it could be making plans or generating new ideas on creativity tasks. So oftentimes people turn to groups when they wish to generate creative solutions to problems. Um, and although groups are very effective 
and very creative overall, um, procedures must be put in place to maximize their creativity. They are not by nature necessarily more creative than individuals. Subsequent analyses looking at uh, Steiner's, um, excuse me, um, Dr. McGrath's typology of tasks does find that some groups can do many of these types of tasks where some are more specialized and can only succeed at tasks in particular quadrants. But in general, we turn to groups when we face very difficult tasks, ones which are very complicated and very important. Um, that would be, for example, flying a jetliner. It is very difficult. It is quite complex. Um, and it's very important to make sure, for safety reasons, that this task is performed effectively. However, in some cases, we do turn to groups to perform tasks just simply because groups are interesting and fun and it's more enjoyable to be with other people if we're working on dull and monotonous tasks. Uh, Ivan Steiner wrote in 1972, published his book, Group Process and Productivity, in which he tried to, to draw together various studies of group performance, particularly to explain why groups don't perform up to their full potential. His basic idea, which is summarized here in his Law of Productivity, is that actual productivity is equal to potential productivity minus process loss. So as group members try to work collectively, there's factors in the group that, that reduce uh, their success overall. It could be a case of poor communication, for example. It could be that one group member who, who is necessary for success at the task is absent that day. It could be that as the tasks that go, the, the overall task is broken into subtasks and then assigned to individual group members, that assignment goes badly so that individuals who are good at particular subtasks are given the wrong subtasks. It could be the case that the leader of the group does not perform effectively, does not provide the group with sufficient structure, um, doesn't uh, pay attention to the relationships among group members. Many factors can combine to cause process loss. And Steiner suggests that inevitably um, the potential productivity is rarely equal to, to actual productivity. We'll begin our analysis of, of group performance with a, a very simple group situation, the performance in the presence of other people. So it could be a very simple, almost individualistic task. Um, digging a ditch, for example. Um, studying group dynamics for an upcoming examination. Uh, it could be riding a bicycle, for example. These are all tasks that individuals can perform by themselves or in the presence of others. And the question that group researchers have asked is, do, do people, when performing these sorts of very simple tasks, uh, perform more effectively when others are present, or do they perform them more effectively when alone? This is a question that was asked many years ago in one of the very first studies conducted by social psychologists, perhaps not the first study conducted by social psychologists, but certainly uh, um, among the earliest studies by Norman Triplett. He was interested in the performance of individuals. He was a, a, a cycling enthusiast, and he couldn't help but notice that when individuals uh, raced in bicycle races against other competitors, their performance improved. And even when they tried their hardest when racing against a, a clock, when their performance was timed, uh, they still could not race as quickly as they could when, when performing with others. Triplett investigated this, this change in performance with a, a piece of equipment he built in which children would stand at, this, at one of these two reels and reel as quickly as they could. And you either did it by yourself working here or you worked collectively with another person although the results were not collaborative in a sense. Um, he did find that individuals working in the presence of others improved their performance. This was due in, port, in part due to the competition they experienced. But Triplett also found that uh, even though individuals were not attempting to compete or outdo each other, simply the presence of other people facilita facilitated performance. Researchers replicated Triplett's findings, but 
in some cases failed to do so. Uh, in, in some cases, the presence of others actually seemed to inhibit task performance. And it wasn't until 1965 when Robert Zients offered up his motivational analysis of social facilitation to try to clarify when precisely social facilitation effects will occur. His analysis draws a distinction between simple tasks and complex tasks, and also dominant responding and non-dominant responding. As he points out, a simple task is one in which the dominant response is the correct response in the situation. It might be a by dominant response that means something that's well learned, very easily performed. It could be an actually an unlearned task, but one which is a simple reflex, um, one that's uh, practically instinctive, such as swallowing food, for example, would be a dominant response. Uh, complex tasks require non-dominant responses. Uh, they may be poorly learned responses. They may be novel responses. Uh, they're not the instinctive response that sets the situation. You, you have to, in fact, resist performing automatically and control yourself and perform a different response. And that would be the non-dominant response. What science analysis suggests is that the presence of others increases dominant responses and decreases uh, the tendency to perform non-dominant responses. If the task is a simple one, it probably requires dominant responses, and that results in social facilitation and a performance gain. But the presence of others, it, since it reduces the likelihood of a non-dominant response being correct, so the task requires a non-dominant response, social facilitation will occur and you'll find a process loss. So on complicated tasks, which require those non-dominant responses, the presence of others can inhibit performance rather than facilitate performance. Researchers have confirmed this in a variety of studies, even with non-human species. A science is study in which he put cockroaches into performance situations and timed how rapidly they could perform a task. And as with triplets bicycle racing, uh, the, the, the more rapid the, the speed at which the cockroaches ran their maze, the more effective their performance. And for cockroaches, we have simple tasks and complicated tasks. A simple task is just a very, well, it's a straight line shot. The roaches were put into a, a one corner of a simple maze and the bright light turned on and they tried to escape by running to the dark inside end of the maze. And you could see when could they do that more quickly. Could they do it when they are with another roach or when they were alone? And you found social facilitation effects. Uh, they were able to perform this simple task more quickly when with another roach, or actually watched by another roach in some cases, than when they were alone. And that reversed for a more complicated type of maze. It had a corner. They had to turn a corner in order to escape the light. It certainly took them much longer to perform the complex maze than the simple maze. If you're not interested in roaches but human beings, um, Hazel Marcus in an early study um, found the same basic effect that had been found for cockroaches, uh, looking at people putting on familiar clothing versus unfamiliar clothing. Um, and by unfamiliar, it might be, for example, an apron which ties in the back or a pair of shoes which are difficult to lace and have unusual laces. And you found the same effect that for unusual kinds of garment, tying your apron in the back, the presence of others inhibited performance, whereas putting on clothes you are very familiar with um, improve performance in the presence of others. There are a variety of theories which try to explain social facilitation and basically all uh, are, are necessary to explain aspects of this fascinating social phenomenon. Um, Zions himself offered up his drive theory. Um, he coined the word compresence, um, arguing that the presence of other people elevates drive levels. It's slightly motivating. And people do show signs of physiological arousal when others are present, even when those other people are not threatening, don't seem to be evaluative. Um, Jim Blaskovich's work on his challenge versus threat response um, also finds that in many cases people experience challenge as a result of others being present, that results in social facilitation. But if they feel threatened by the presence of others, then that will lead to social interference. Evaluation apprehension strongly stresses the importance of 
what's the audience doing? Is it an evaluative audience? Uh, Cottrell's analysis suggests that when people feel as though the others present in the situation are highly evaluative, that will facilitate performance on simple, well-learned tasks. Uh, the example might be a person giving a speech, for example. If you know the audience that you're giving the speech to is highly evaluative, but you really know your speech, you've practiced it thousands of times, then the presence of other people will facilitate performance. But if it's an, it's if you haven't practiced the speech very much, it's not well learned, it's, it's a non-dominant response, and you know other people will be evaluating you, then it will likely undermine your performance. Uh, distraction conflict theory and mere effort theory, these are two theories that, that stress the cognitive processes which probably are in, play an important role in creating social facilitation responses. Uh, Steve Harkins, for example, in his mere effort model, he suggests that in many situations that dominant response is the most immediate, rapid, easily accessed response. But in complicated situations, that is not the correct response, and so it takes longer for you to shift from the non-dominant, almost automatic response, um, from, the, from the dominant, almost automatic response, to the non-dominant response. So he's investigating, again, it's using the remote associates test, and he finds strong evidence that the presence of others tends to increase, um, inhibit, tends to increase the performance of dominant responses making performance on the remote associates tests more difficult. A final uh, individual differences explanation offered more recently is that social facilitation depends apart on the personalities of the individuals, that there are some people who are respond more positively to the presence of others. And so they're far more likely to show social facilitation effects rather than social inhibition effects. So there are a number of theoretical explanations that can account for social facilitation. But still, we find the phenomenon applies in many different situations, eating in groups, for example. Usually the presence of others since this is such a simple task, it, it tends to result in social facilitation. People tend to eat more rapidly when they're with other people. They eat larger quantities of food. And it does turn out that people maybe have an intuitive understanding of this process because as they prepare food for larger and larger groups, they make more and more food. Um, um, inconsistently, in fact, with the number of people present. So, for example, if you, you are baking a meal for four people, you don't make four times as much food, you make five times as much food. An eight-person group, it's not eight times as much food, but ten times as much food. So people recognize, the, intuitively at least, that eating in groups is, facilitates performance. Other applications of social facilitation include the tendency for people who, who are trying to not say prejudiced things to actually blurt out uh, prejudicial statements in the presence of others since their racist tendencies are well-learned responses. People have also applied this process in performance in business settings um, where uh, workers working on relatively routine tasks, their performance is monitored by computer programs and it will facilitate their performance so long as they're working on very simple tasks. For students, perhaps the take-home message is when is it best to work in groups uh, versus work alone. Um, learning groups, particularly if you're just learning the concept, if it's difficult for you, perhaps the presence of others will actually inhibit your performance. Study groups are very effective methods for learning material, particularly when group members can share notes and teach one another and, and collaborate as they prepare for an exam but particularly in the earlier, early stages of learning, when the material is very poorly known and quite challenging, uh, the presence of others might lead to social interference rather than social facilitation. In our next segment, we will turn to the question of social loafing and the Ringelman effect. When do people working on tasks where they combine their individual productivity into a final collective group product, um, when do they perform these tasks, of, these types of tests effectively, and when do they perform them ineffectively? Thank you as always for joining me in this analysis of group performance.